everyone. Welcome to Hopkins at Home. Uh, my name is John Hessler and I'm a specialist in computational geography and geographic information science at the Library of Congress and also a lecturer here at Johns Hopkins. Um, today we're going to take a little um, dive into um, some of the pandemics that have happened in the Americas. Um, we're going to look at smallpox, look at SARS, uh, COVID-2, the thing that is sort of haunting our lives right now. Um, and talk about some of the other things associated with both of these very different pandemics. Um, as we go on, if you have some questions, you can write them in the chat box and we will have some time at the end of our uh, lecture and our talk here to get to some of the questions. Um, but for right now, we're just gonna kind of jump right in. Um, we're gonna begin by talking about really the history of at least what we know about the history of pandemics in the Americas, beginning with the smallpox pandemic, um, which was more of an epidemic, which um, obviously wiped out, as far as everyone knows, a large portion of the population of the indigenous peoples um, of the Americas, especially in, in Mexico and in the Caribbean islands after the landing of Columbus and the Spanish um, the coming of the Spanish in 1492, and then with the coming of Cortes um, into Cozumel and into Mexico. Um, those pandemics, the smallpox pandemic is one of the most interesting, and it has some interesting comparisons to where we are today uh, with the current SARS COVID-2 uh, pandemic we are all involved in right now. So we're, we're gonna take a comparison. We're gonna see what we know about the smallpox, um, um, and then we're going to move over and jump a couple of centuries to where we are now and really look at the difference in the way we can look at these two pandemics, look at the tech, how the technology has changed, um, look at the way we've been finding out things about SARS-CoV-2 and talk about some of the issues um, that are really in the news surrounding it. Um, everything from it jumping from animal hosts um, all the way to contact tracing and things like that. So we're going to take a close look at both of these. Um, and in the, in the, as we move on, as we move through this, we're going to get a fairly good idea of, of, of how um, we look at pandemics, both historically and, and in current time. Um, we're going to begin in kind of a strange place um, for talking about the pandemics in the Americas. We're gonna begin in Vilnius. Um, and in fact, we're gonna begin in the crypt of the Dominican Church of the Holy Spirit, um, which you see on the screen here. Um, this is really one of the places where our information um, about smallpox uh, becomes very important um, and becomes very um, interesting. Um, there underneath the uh, crypt in the crypt of this particular church, uh, was found a whole series of mummies um, several years ago. Uh, these mummies were known for quite some time, um, but it was really only uh, in the last decade where researchers had begun taking a close look at them. Um, there's a particular child mummy who um, died sometime between 1643 and 1665, um, who when their DNA uh, was sequenced and when they were looked at very closely, um, smallpox, a particular strain of smallpox was found um, in the mummy. Um, now, not all of the mummies uh, in the crypt contained uh, the smallpox uh, virus, but um, one really particular one did. Uh, the one interesting thing we have to remember, and the two things we're going to kind of take from this uh, lecture today, is we're looking at two different kinds of, of viruses. When we talk about smallpox and we talk about COVID, um, one of them is a DNA virus, so it's a double-stranded genetic code, and one is an RNA virus which is what uh, COVID-19 and SARS is. And really they're very different in the way they behave. They're very different in the way um, they infect people. They're very different in the way um, they make a jump from animals to humans. Um, DNA viruses tend to be very large. They tend to be much bigger than RNA viruses. And this is gonna be a really key element uh, when we get in and start talking about um, COVID. Uh, a little bit later on. So the DNA virus, the, the, the variola virus that we're talking about now, which is smallpox, 
um, has between 135,000 and 375,000 base pairs in its genetic code, which is fairly large. Um, when we get down to something like COVID-19, we're only talking about 29,000 base pairs, only about 29,000 nucleotides. So a very small piece of genetic uh, material. So there's not much information stored in 29,000 um, base pairs. So it's a, it, it has to exploit other ways of, of reproducing. Whereas a DNA virus, because it is a double stranded, it can correct its mutations, uh, it's a lot more stable. Um, and it's gonna be a big difference as we, we move forward. Um, the smallpox vaccine that is found in um, the child mummy that we're gonna just talk about in just a little bit um, is the oldest complete genome of any virus that we have. Um, so it's a, it's a really important, a really important find um, that this particular virus was found in this child mummy. Um, it has the same pattern of gene degradation as 20th century strains of the virus. Now that is going to be very critical um, because one of the things we're very interested in is why was the smallpox so lethal to the indigenous uh, peoples of the Americas? Um, there is, of course, this idea that they had no immunity to European diseases, but it seems to have been a magnitude above the way that some of the um, European um, strains were faced. And it's going to be very important. Um, one of the things that we're going to find and we're going to see in just a little while is molecular clock studies. And so what a molecular clock study does is that in DNA viruses, mutations build at a certain rate. Um, so you can see the divergence from um, as time goes on and you can kind of backtrack and try and figure out what the timing of a particular set of mutations or a particular um, group of mutations when they happened. Uh, because they happened at a regular period. And one of the interesting things about um, this particular mummy is that the, the virus that we're seeing seems to have started, uh, seems to have been a particularly virulent strain of smallpox, and it seems to have started in Europe in the late 1490s and early to hitch a ride to, to the Americas. And we're going to see that the, the actual um, strain we're talking about in this child mummy in, in Vilnius has a lot to do um, with the strains that in fact um, we see in the Americas. And so really what we have in, in Europe at this period, a smallpox is, is around, um, it kind of comes up in place after place after place, but it doesn't have this large scale pandemic effect um, the way we would see something like the influenza um, or HIV or any of these more large scale pandemics that we're so used to talking about. Um, it seems to have been localized when it happened. Now it happened and it bounced around Europe in local groups, um, but it seems to have been a much more localized effect. Now, when we talk about this particular mummy, she seems to have died between 1643 and 1665, and she's between two and four years old. Um, there are several mummies in, in the, the child mummies in the crypt. Um, the one that is the most important um, was only a torso and legs. In other words, the pelvis down. The rest of the mummy seems to have been missing. Um, and it is from this particular um, mummy um, that the smallpox was in fact um, um, isolated. Now, if we look here, now what we've got here is we have a phy phylogenetic tree. And for those of you who aren't sort of familiar with looking at these kind of things and don't have any background in genetics or zoology or anything like that, what these trees do is basically they show us the relationship um, between various genetic strains. So when we sequence anything, a sample of a virus, um, we can put it into a computer and doing some fairly complex and difficult analysis, um, basically come to terms with what the similarities and differences are. And as we get down to the base of the tree, so if you <coughs> look at the, the, this tree here, as we get down to the base here, the things that are over on this side, the far left-hand side, are the things that came first. In other words, all the rest of the, the things are related to this. Um, and this particular tree is a, an overall tree of, of both the Vilnius virus and a whole bunch of samples, 49 samples from around the world uh, in different places through time, um, the oldest one going back into the 1940s. 
um, and then looking at the relationship. So when we sequence the Vilnius sample, so the sample that comes out of the child mummy, we see that it appears right here. So in this turquoise is that Vilnius sample from 1654 <clears throat> or thereabouts, excuse me. Um, and what we see is we see that it's at the base of the tree, which means all of these other um, samples are in fact related to this particular strain. This particular strain predates um, the, all this entire group. So it's on the same clad. So it's very much related to this entire group. Now this particular tree also takes into account two other um, different types of, of poxes. These are actually found in animals. Um, and one of the things that's unique about um, or interesting about smallpox is it's currently only found in human beings. It's not found in animal hosts, but it's very related um, to various types of poxes that are found in, in animal hosts. So when this particular sequence was done, um, what we really see here is we see that these two other poxes are outliers. Um, so in other words, we're on the same sort of historical clad, um, but they're not directly related to, to these um, in a very close way. And so they're put in there to kind of test what's going on here. Uh, and so one of the mysteries of smallpox and one of the, the open questions still is, is when did it evolve to make its move out of um, an animal host? Um, and that's a very important thing for people today when talking about smallpox and, and what is happening um, for vaccines of smallpox and whether smallpox will ever come back. Um, viruses that move from animals to human beings are called zoonotic viruses. Um, and really most of the emerging viruses that we're seeing today, and of course COVID-19 um, and SARS before that, um, HIV, um, all of those made a move from an animal host at some time in the past. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But what we see here is we see this particular strain of the virus being related to a whole bunch of, of, of other ones. So it really does predate um, all of the samples that we have. So it's the oldest sequence of, of smallpox that, that we actually have. Now, if we look at this a little bit again, um, the same exact um, um, kind of methodology, and we begin dating um, when we think that these samples began breaking off. In other words, what are the dates um, that we see the mutations uh, in all of these samples occurring? Um, and using a molecular clock, in other words, using the way that mutations build up over time, um, we can actually date the, the, the point where this particular um, virus we're talking about, this particular sample, um, basically broke off. When did it, when did it emerge? Um, so this particular tree, this phylogenetic tree, has 40 modern, my, modern strains. And when looking at the modern strains, there, there's a point where we have the vaccination, pre and post vaccination period. Um, this is all post vaccination uh, samples. The only sample we have pre-vaccination in this clod is, is right here, which is the sample we're talking about for the mummy. When we look at this with a molecular clock, we can actually trace it back to what is a common ancestor, which is thought to just be before 1530. So this particular strain, which has a, all of the relationships that we see with um, the rest of the strains around the world, um, including those that came to the new world, um, we basically see that, that this particular strain began um, sometime before 1530. So basically just in time um, to make its way to the new world. So we know that, that this particular lucky find of this particular mummy has given us uh, the oldest sequence of smallpox that we have. And we can see that, that what was happening around the world um, at a later period is related to this particular strain. And that this particular strain um, seems to have um, come into existence or began bef just before 1530 or in the, in the late um, 15th and early 16th centuries. And this is kind of important because when we're looking to trace sort of what happens in the new world very early on, we have very limited resources to work with. So we have some archeological evidence. Um, obviously we've been getting much better at, at doing ancient DNA um, but looking at these viral fragments, it's very difficult to reconstruct um, the history 
um, much earlier than, than where we are at this particular kinds of samples in the, in the late um, 15th, early 16th centuries. Um, <clears throat> but what we have, what we do know about the New World strains and about what happened in the New World mostly comes from both Spanish and, and indigenous sources, um, which is a very different thing from um, where we are right now. So when we're trying to look historically at vaccines, uh, or at, at viruses, there's a lot that informs um, what we're doing now, but the evidence for the science and the evidence for the transmission uh, around the world is very different. And what you're gonna see um, as we move forward into the COVID-19 and into the SARS era, um, the amount of data, the amount of information that we've been able to bring to bear um, on, these on the pa current pandemic is unprecedented. Um, in the history of epidemiology and the history of, 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 of looking at these viruses. And it's not just going to be about tracing cases, and in other words, the number of cases here and there and where they crop up, but really looking at the way the geno genome of the virus is changing as it's moving around the world in and out of human hosts. And so there's a lot that we know um, uh, now about how these kind of things move, which we can then begin to infer um, into these historical uh, epidemics, which gives us a better idea of how they moved and we can begin to reevaluate some of the, the actual sources we do have. Now, when we're talking about information for smallpox in the new world, um, we're really talking about a real series of indigenous and Spanish sources. And really the most important come from a really critical period of time between 1520 and 1521. And this is really the beginning of the conquest of the new world. Um, this is really when Cortez um, is coming into um, what, what, um, what would become Mexico City um, and the conquest of, of, of Mexico and, and the large movement of, of, of Spanish um, and African um, um, people into this particular region. The earliest source we have um, for smallpox in this area um, uh, comes from a man named Vasquez de Elion, um, who was a judge. And basically he records um, that when he gets to Cozumel, um, he finds very few indigenous peoples there. And what's, what's interesting about it is he will actually write that the natives had been struck um, by the disease introduced by Hispaniola. Um, a little bit before this earliest record is on August 30th, 1520. In April of 1520, a man named Panfilo de Narvez um, landed in Veracruz after coming from Cozumel. And he went to Veracruz because um, there was a storm. Um, he was with a flutella. They left Cozumel. Cozumel is an island and they're, they're sailing for the mainland. And they encountered a storm. Um, they were forced to land at, at Veracruz and Panfilo Nar Narvez writes that um, as soon as they arrive there, um, the smallpox uh, immediately breaks out. Um, and Vasquez writes to Charles V that the natives had been struck by the disease introduced by Hispaniola. So we have this source coming from um, this, this flotilla coming from Cozumel, um, leaving April 1520. Um, we have Vasquez uh, de Ayon um, writing to Charles V that the, the the uh, natives on Hispaniola and, and, and or on Cozumel have been struck by this disease, um, which is just a few months after um, Narvez leaves, um, and that in uh, Veracruz, that smallpox immediately broke out um, when this flotilla arrived. So we, we actually see um, in the historical records um, this kind of transmission. Um, in January 1521, just a few months later, um, Cortez and his troops returned to central Mexico. And he also writes in a letter to Charles V that the deaths of many of the natives were due to smallpox distemper, which, which also enveloped those of these lands like those on the islands. And so even by 1521, so very early on, um, we have these very early Spanish sources basically narrating uh, the way smallpox is moving around um, um, in, into the indigenous community. And that is the earliest record we do have, which is August 30th, 1520, um, of a Spanish source talking about 
um, indigenous individuals die, dying from smallpox. It's a very important source uh, of, of information. Now, other sources that we have are, are even more interesting. Um, uh, that just gives us some of the, the narration. Um, but we have some other very important um, larger works. Um, uh, Bernardino de Sahagún um, was a monk who, between 1545 and, and 1590, uh, basically sent questionnaires to indigenous representatives, to elders, um, in the Nahua language, in other words, in the Aztec language, um, asking them about what happened in the past, their experiences, what kind of plants they used, um, their entire culture. And by the time he dies in 1590, he accumulated more than 2,400 pages of this um, information. And he also had um, nine or 10 indigenous artists illustrate um, this, this book, which is now called the Florentine Codex. Um, and it really is an important source of information. It talks about medicines, it talks about disease, and it really, it gives us our first illustration sometime after 1545, um, but before 1590, uh, we have our first illustration of, of smallpox occurring in the New World. Um, Saagun also talks a lot about some of the medicines, some of the things people were using um, in order to fight the disease. Um, there are some other sources. There's both um, 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 some other uh, Spanish doctors, uh, which we'll get to in just a bit, talking about the pandemic. Uh, and, and how the indigenous peoples were fighting it and, and what actual symptoms they saw. Um, there's some very, very detailed symptomatic information that we can glean from, from a variety of sources. Um, one important one uh, is called the Annals of the Kekichel. Now, the Kekichel were a different group. They're actually Maya. Kekichel is actually one of the 32 Maya languages. Um, there's a very important 17th century manuscript, um, which is a copy of a much earlier text. Um, it's written in, in Kekchikel, and it describes multiple outbreaks of, um, of, the, uh, of smallpox. Uh, and it really is an eyewitness testimony, one of the earliest eyewitness testimonies to the actual symptoms. And I'm just going to read a translation of just a small section of the text here. And it says, in the six months after the arrival of the Lord President in Pagan, the plague which had last lashed the people long ago began here. Little by little, it arrived here. In truth, a fearful death fell on our heads by the will of our powerful God. Many families succumbed to the plague. Now the people were overcome by intense cold and fever. Blood came out of their noses. Then came a cough growing worse and worse. The neck was twisted and small and large sores broke out on them. The disease attacked everyone. On the day of circumcision, January 1st, 1560, a Monday, while I was writing, I was attacked by the epidemic. So the actual author is basically narrating the, the fact that he also um, was attacked by, by the epidemic. He's narrating um, in 1560, 1562, um, what actually happened to him um, as this particular smallpox begins to move um, into the Maya region. So the Kekichel um, are down into the, into the Guatemalan highlands. Um, so we're, we're coming across the, <clears throat> what is now the Mexican border. So um, this is another one of the important early sources. Another source, which is um, really, really critical to our understanding of, of smallpox and the way the indigenous peoples of the Americas kind of fought against it, um, is a book by Francisco Hernandez de Toledo. Now he was a doctor who um, went to New Spain and spent a lot of time, wrote, more than, wrote a book which contains more than 3000 medicinal plants used by the indigenous peoples. Um, he also um, did autopsies um, on some of those who died. And he um, talked about the disease in terms of the way the Nahua talked about it. Uh, he, he wrote that the fevers were contagious, burning and continuous, all of them pestilential, in most part lethal. The tongue was dry and black, enormous thirst. Then hard and painful nodules appeared behind one or both ears, along with heartache, chest pain, abdominal pain, tremor, great anxiety, and dysentery. Pustules covered the body. 
those attacked by dysentery were usually saved if they complied with the medication. And the medication he's talking about um, is uh, in, in Nawa called Zamaltel, um, which is basically um, uh, this plant we're looking at right here. The, it, the root is, 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 is boiled. Um, and it's still used traditionally for malaria fevers. And, and um, basically what, what Hernandez tells us is that he's sweating. And it was heat by, by drinking the, a tea of the ground roots of this particular plant. Um, the particular plant has been studied quite extensively. It does have certain analgesic properties. It's also quite poisonous if taken in, in, in too big, a, um, too big of, a, of, of a dose. Uh, there was a sophisticated um, indigenous medicinal ethnobotany and pharmacology. There's a group of manuscripts. This is called the Badianus manuscript, which really outlines in, in real detail the medicines that were derived from plants to fight various diseases. Um, and it was quite interesting that um, indigenous traditional um, um, medicine really attempted to work against what was happening to them. Uh, we see salves being produced. We see these analgesic uh, plants being being used. Uh, we also see a mixture of, of sort of magical and superstitious things being used um, by sources. And so we have a lot of um, a lot of information about actually how uh, the pandemic was 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 fought and and really how indigenous populations kind of reacted to it. And we also have the Spanish sources um, telling us kind of how it moved uh, and, and, um, and a little bit at least about what the symptoms were. Um, and it does appear that most of what we're talking about is smallpox. Um, there are other things that, that kind of filter in here. There seems to be some um, hemorrhagic uh, fevers, some, some fevers which are somewhat like Ebola-like that, that, um, that are talked about. But for the most part, we see uh, the symptoms being very much related to smallpox. So the evidence that, that kind of comes through uh, when we're talking about the, the smallpox epidemic um, is, is not very much. It's, it's somewhat sketchy. We do have the genomic evidence, um, but we do get a, fee a good feeling for the fact um, that smallpox came. We see how it moved around. Um, and uh, we do have some of the indigenous and, and Spanish reactions to it. Uh, what we don't have is any real good information on um, the actual individual facts of occurrence, uh, when something occurred, how it occurred, what the particular will never have. Um, but it is the kind of information that we will get today um, when we talk about the COVID-19. Um, when we talk about where we are today, we're talking about a lot um, more information, a lot more ideas about how the disease moves. And we're going to spend a little time for what we have left on talking about exactly how COVID is different from smallpox, how the epidemic is different, and how it's the same. Um, but really how the amount of information we have and the amount of information that we will have as, as, as the history goes forward um, on the epidemics of today and the pandemics of today is, is, is so much more. And, 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 but will also allow us to kind of look back and see, wow, that's what they were doing. That's what they were looking at. That's why they were writing that information down. Um, the sources for the, the Spanish sources have not really been um, looked at in, 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 a, in a modern sense. In other words, in a sense, okay, let's see if we can actually, looking at these early sources, trace how the disease moved and where it moved first, um, kind of combining all of these different languages, all of these different chronicles that were written at the period to kind of get a sense of how, how the disease moved. Um, these things are filled with all kinds of, of, of data that has yet to really been, be exploited. Now, when we're talking about the where we are today, we're, we're talking about a very different time. Um, we see at this point in time, a lot of emerging viruses. Um, uh, almost all of them are RNA viruses. And so instead of that double-stranded DNA um, of, of smallpox, we just have a single strand. We just have half of the, of the helix. Um, and what that means is that because the genome is only half, 
uh, it can't check itself when it mutates. It can't self-correct. Um, there's a thing called the polymerase chain reaction, which is the self-correcting mechanism that DNA has in order to kind of slow its mutation rate down. But RNA viruses don't have that. So they have a super huge mutation rate. They mutate very rapidly. <clears throat> they also produce, um, reproduce inside their hosts very rapidly. Um, they have a small genome. Uh, in the case of, um, of um, COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, we're only talking about 30,000 nucleotides. Um, so a very small genetic um, uh, amount of genetic information. Just in contrast, for those of you who don't know the magnitude of these, you would need about 3 billion um, base pairs in order to build a, a mouse from scratch. So it's a, a very small piece of information. Um, so what we see here is we see the structure of actually of COVID-19, um, the SARS um, uh, COVID-2 virus. I'm going to use those two terms um, interchangeably. SARS-CoV-2 is actually the name of the virus. COVID-19 is actually the name of the disease that is caused by SARS-CoV-2, but I'm going to keep using them interchangeably um, simply because everyone else does at this point in common parlance. But um, it looks like this. Uh, it has a round um, case, which is called the capsid. It has these things called spike proteins, and inside the capsid is basically where the genetic material of the, of the virus um, resides. Um, the spike protein structure is extremely important, and it's going to be something we're going to talk um, about quite a bit as we're talking about um, the, the, um, the COVID virus. Um, it is really where um, the virus can begin to link up with a human cell and then break the, the capsid and inject the, the, the viral RNA into, um, into the, a human cell. Um, how the spike protein is formed, um, uh, how, what kind of proteins are there, what kind of receptors are there, are critically important to the evolution of the virus and, and it moving into a, a, a host. Um, when we look at something like this, so here we have a, a model of the COVID virus, um, and these are the spike proteins. And they have a particular form, and when they're looking to, to basically match up with a, a human cell, the spike protein kind of opens up a little bit and it reveals a, an important spot um, in the structure of the protein. And we'll get to this in just a mi minute. So you'll see this will just open up a little bit here. And this will be where the ACE2 receptors are. And these are very important. These are the binding sites where the, the spike protein binds with the human um, um, cell. Um, an extremely important point. Um, the evolution of that particular receptor, that particular place, is critically important to how a coronavirus operates. Now, coronavirus has these spikes. It looks like a crown, hence the name corona, um, the Latin crown. And so these binding sites are critically important for how the, the virus actually operates and, and its success in actually binding to a human um, site. So when we're talking about um, the COVID virus. So here is um, um, two things we're looking at here. On the left-hand side, you see the phylogenetic tree of the mutations um, of the COVID-19 um, virus, so the, co uh, the SARS virus. Um, and on the right-hand side there, you see a map um, of its spread around the world. Now, what we're looking at here is we're looking at the colors are the mutations and the, the paths are how it's spread. Um, it's extremely complicated, obviously, and we're going to break this down a little bit, but I want to really dig into this to show you actually how we know when the virus came to which particular places and, and when. So the reason we can do this now and we couldn't do it before is we've got a whole bunch of different groups like GSIAAD, which are taking all of the information and all of the genome sequences from, that are being done in labs around the world and putting them in one place um, so people can actually look at all of the data at once and begin to, to pull it apart to kind of learn something. Um, in the past, a lot of this was very ad hoc. Uh, a couple of labs would have their sequences, other labs, and you'd, you'd have to wait for papers to be published. But aggregating the data like this into one place has been um, revolutionary in the last few um, um, pandemics, in the last few epidemics. GSI Day was really founded in order to look at, at influenza, 
uh, which of course COVID-19 is related to, um, but it's been instrumental in, in, in all of the data that I'm gonna talk about now. So when we look at this phylogenetic tree, as I said, all of the different dots that you see are particular genomes that have been sequenced. So in other words, a sample of the virus that has come out of a, a human being that has been sequenced. Now, when we're talking about mutations, what that means is that some of the nucleotides, some of the base pairs juggle each other up a little bit. Um, and as we talked about with the smallpox, um, we can relate all of those different jugglings to these trees. In other words, to patterns of, of, of evolution as the virus is mutating and evolving, we can see commonalities and we can see errors being introduced that are carried through. And that's how these trees are in fact built. Now, looking at this tree, um, which is the full tree um, of, of the, of the COVID-19 at this point. Um, we see down here all of these purple um, uh, dots. And, and for the most part, these are all um, the sequence of mutations that are happening in China. So we can see this is back in December uh, of 2019. And this is the beginning of, of the virus. And these are actual sequences that have been done showing the evolution of the virus in China. So these are the mutations that are actually occurring in, in China. Now, if we blow this tree up a little bit, okay, so in other words, what we're doing is we're just zooming into the tree here. We can see we're in this, this Chinese area here, in this area of, the, of the, the things that were happening in Wuhan. Now, of course, everyone believes that um, this came out of the, the wet market uh, in Wuhan. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a bit. But we can see this red dot appearing at this point on this particular clad. And this is actually the first case in the United States. This is the one from um, Washington State. Um, you can see that it is on the, the clad, so very, very closely related to the Chinese um, uh, um, um, groups. Um, the colors that we're putting on here um, relate to, to the geospatial location. So in other words, what we have on these, this, this particular kind of graph here is we have both location, we have the mutations, and we have the time. So as we can see, the time goes forward as we go by this. And then this is the first case that occurs in the United States. We can also see a couple of other stray cases that are occurring here um, in Illinois, um, in Wisconsin, um, but this is the first case in Washington state. And then you can see as the mutations move in, as time goes on, the mutations spread as we go um, forward into North America. Um, so this is really the way that we begin to recognize how this disease is being transmitted on a very, very precise um, um, way um, that we couldn't do before. Now, when we zoom out back out from, from that tree a little bit, um, the first case, like we said, is, is here. This was that first case in Washington state. Um, we can see that there's another part of the tree that begins to build. Um, and this is a branch that's going into France. So this is the European branch that's beginning to develop here. Again, we see the, the tree breaking out. Um, the green is, is moving the disease into Europe. And again, we see these mutations stretching out in time as, as things occur. And we can see fairly closely and fairly precisely when these things begin, begin to happen. Now, one of the interesting things is here we have that branch originating in France and that begins to increase. And then we begin to see these North American, in other words, these red clads beginning to develop. And these are the two branches that are leading to New York. So what we can see by looking at the, these phylogenetic trees is there's two independent introductions here um, to the United States. We see the, that introduction going into Washington state from, from the Asian branch, from the Chinese branch. Um, and then, we can see um, the beginnings of the second thing, which is actually coming from Europe. So there's two independent introductions, one coming from Europe and one coming from China. Um, the introduction of the of the of the the, um, the of COVID-19 into the New York um, occurred at a time when flights from Europe were not banned. So in other words, it was before that period. It was in that period where flights from China were banned, but flights from Europe were not. And we can begin to see um, that we can look at exactly how the disease is, is moving um, very, very precisely. Um, this can be done at an extremely precise level. In other words, we can begin to move into this tree 
Um, and you see that all of the red here is the North American stuff, but you can see mixed in here, um, there is various different colors, um, which really represent basically the disease moving from the United States back out to other places. So for example, we have all of these, this clad right here, we can see Texas, we can see Louisiana, um, these, this is the southern United States. And then all of a sudden we have this branch right here, which is a mutation from Australia. Um, in other words, the disease being introduced back into Australia, um, coming from, from, from this US branch, which is related to cases in Louisiana. Um, so there's a great deal of common between the mutations that one sees in, 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 these Louis, in the Louisiana case and in this particular group of cases from Australia. So using these methods, we can really begin to, to understand how um, COVID-19 actually moves. Now, we talked about early on that ACE2 binding human receptor and that spike protein is critical um, into human beings. Um, everyone is fairly confident, um, like the first SARS outbreak, which came from um, a, a group of bats, a genus of bats called the rhinolophus bats, um, that COVID-19 um, has made a jump from an animal source. Um, there were rhinolophus bats that were in the wet market um, in Wuhan. There were also many other animals which could be possible sources. Uh, in the case of the SARS epidemic, the first COVID epidemic, which, which was not as bad uh, in the United States, obviously, as this one, um, but did affect some other areas around the world. Um, it was found that the bat virus, the virus that was found in bats, um, needed an intermediate host. In other words, it was not quite alike enough or there was not enough interaction between the rhinolophus bats and, and, and humans and, and something called a, a, a palm cive. Um, which is a, a sort of wild cat, um, uh, was the thing that actually passed it on to human beings. We see a lot of this occurring right now. There's a lot of zoonotic um, viruses, um, which are the emerging viruses um, in the world. We can see things like Marburg and Nipah. Um, even HIV was a zoonotic virus that jumped from chimpanzees. Um, and so it's very important um, that we, um, that, that we understand exactly what this dynamics is. Um, there's a couple of people who have found and, and done some research now on looking at, at the various bat viruses. Um, there's a couple of species, one called Rhinolophus saphinus, which was found to be 96% similar to the overall COVID-2, but it differs in important ways in the spike proteins. In other words, in that ACE2 binding receptor. Uh, that would allow what the virus is inside the bat to make the jump to humans, to bind to a human cell. Um, so there's also this thought that there might need to be an intermediate um, uh, animal amplifier. Um, the best study that has been done so far um, um, really looks at um, another, a different species called Rhinolophus meleanus. <coughs> um, um, and what we see here is we can see, again, another one of these phylogenetic trees, which again are critically important to understanding um, what we're looking at here. We can see um, this is the Wuhan human virus right here. Um, and we can see the virus, which is called RMY02, which has been found in, in the rhinolophus bat, um, is on the same wing. It's very, very close. Um, it's also much closer in the spike protein. So really the jury is still out on whether there's a necessary intermediate host. Um, we don't really know uh, enough about um, how all of the various families or how all of the various species of rhinolophus bats um, are related to one another. Um, obviously, this has now, of course, been an ongoing piece of research, which is happening very quickly. Um, and so we don't really know um, what the possibilities are for that virus to actually make the jump to, to human beings. Um, live virus has been found um, along with antibodies in, in several different bat populations, and in fact, nearly 50 different species of bats. Um, and so it's still a, a completely open question um, at this point.
Um, the last thing we're going to talk about um, is really what's happening now. Um, I've talked a lot about mutations in these two papers, which are um, up on the screen here, um, I have just come out in the last week, um, and they're extremely important. Um, they talk about something called the D614G mutation. Um, this is a particular kind of mutation, which again happens in the spike protein. Um, here is a, a model of the spike protein, a protein model. And what this means, this D614G, it means that D, which is aspartic acid, um, mutates at the 614 site um, to glycine, okay? And it affects a, a whole group of, of amino acid chains. These are two amino acids, the nucleotides in, in, in DNA and RNA form amino acids. Um, and these, this is moving, this is in the, the, um, in the 29,000 uh, sequence of, 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 um, of uh, the COVID genome where aspartic acid has changed the glycine. And it's a particular spot um, on right here on the, the actual, um, on the actual uh, um, spike protein. And it is really important because it appears to be a, um, a, um, a mutation that has basically increased rapidly. In other words, it has kind of taken hold. So this is a, um, a thing from Houston Methodist Research Institute, which has been looking at um, the actual samples um, of, of, of this and, and looking at for this mutation. And we can see that this mutation has grown exponentially um, in the last couple of months. In other words, from really the middle of June to the current time. Um, what's important about it is that when we redo that phylogenetic tree that we looked at, um, we can see that, and we just look for, instead of doing this geospatially or looking at other mutations, we simply look at, um, at D is these turquoise. But then you can see the whole rest of the world um, is basically strung out with this particular mutation. Um, this particular mutation is very important because at this point it appears as if that while not making the disease um, more um, fatal, um, it does appear to be making the transmission of the disease easier. Um, the jury is still out on that. Um, a lot of people are researching this particular thing. As I said, the two papers that I just showed you and the data we're looking at right now um, are really within the last week, week and a half that the papers have been released. Um, but that D614G um, mutation seems to be critically important. So the last slide we'll talk about um, before I take some questions is, is this one here. And really this is kind of a summary of, of the transmission of COVID-19 around the world. Um, there seems to be a, several groups of really independent clads. Uh, in other words, groups of independent mutations that are kind of spreading and have spread around the world. Um, the blue and turquoise that you see, which are labeled 1980 and 19B, were basically prevalent in Asia during the first months of the outbreak. Um, 20A is a huge clad and basically it's dominated by the huge LARP European outbreak that really started before um, any of the major outbreaks um, in North America. Um, there's two other subclads there, which are this, this 20B, um, uh, which is the, the, the resurgence basically, um, um, which is a clearly different set of, um, of uh, mutations from, from the, the, the ones above it. And then there's 20, 20C, which is a largely North American clad, and that's really the, where the North American spread begins. So you can see that for the most part, most of the North American spreads are, are, are really from Europe as opposed to the direct spread from, from Wuhan, um, at least according to the genetics that, that we're looking at. Um, and so we see a real, a real difference, obviously, in, 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 the, in, the, in the way, in the information that we have, um, in, in the way we're actually tracking um, the virus. Um, all of this information is still yet to be mined in a very deep way. Um, so basically, we're, we're really getting to the point now um, where we have so much data that over the next many, many years, scientists, epidemiologists, cartographers, um, which is what I am, 
um, will really begin to pour all over this message and, um, and uh, over this data and really get a clear idea. We can actually really see um, using genomics and, and this geospatial information really how the disease moved. And it may tell us much, much better ways to, to um, prevent these things. So, so I'm gonna take some questions now. Um, there's a bunch of them that have kind of appeared in the chat. And um, um, obviously I'm not gonna get to them all because there's a gazillion of them. Um, but I'm going to take a couple uh, just because it's, it's kind of important. Um, I'm going to take one from Victoria here. What role will smart te um, technologies play in the future of data collection? Um, are there any particular approaches? Well, yes, there are. Um, I actually, um, if I had time, was going to go into that a little bit. It could be an entire another talk about how that actually works, but I actually have, um, I actually have a slide here where I can really talk about how that actually works. Um, so basically the way that works is, is quite simple. Um, uh, you have apps on your phone, the apps on your phone basically um, uh, have these things called SDKs in them, which are inserted into the apps um, by the developers. Those are called um, um, development kits. And basically what they do is they send information from your apps to companies like Rubicon and OpenX of your location about 10 times per minute. Um, and basically you've agreed to this because you've um, uh, not read the fine print in your, um, in, in when you downloaded the app or whatever. Uh, and so basically we can track you and see how close things are coming. So the little graph down below, and then I'll get to another question, basically measures when two or more cell phones come within six feet of each other for more than five minutes. So obviously we can track that. So in the beginning of the, the pandemic, um, obviously, in this, we're going to look at this orange line. There's a huge drop off, which has begun to start back up. So, if we pick a place like Maryland um, here, um, and we can see at the beginning of the pandemic, um, starting in March, we see this huge drop. Um, it reached a low point on April 6th, 2020, um, where there was a 51% drop off in the number of times that a cell phone stayed within six feet of another cell phone for five minutes. You can see, however, now, um, as we're moving towards, and this data goes up till September 5th is I think the last time I, I looked at it, um, it, we're almost back to where we were before. So, but cell phone data is gonna be extremely critical in, in, in how we look at how people move, how they interact. Um, so let's see, another one. Um, well, from, from, from um, L. Jones, um, about the branching and the mutations. Um, one of the things that people are seeing right now with this particular RNA virus, now I said RNA viruses mutate a lot, and they do, because they don't have that polymerase check on their, on their mutations. Um, and so basically, uh, um, those particular things, uh, while they're mutating, there doesn't seem to be a major effect on the actual um, mortality and actual effect of the RNA itself. Um, it seems to be able to transmit more um, as at least what is being implied by the research on the, the D614 G mutation, but it doesn't seem to be more lethal and it doesn't seem to be um, anything that is affecting the way a vaccine would work or whether one would have multiple vaccines. Um, so that, that's, that is um, indeed an open question, but at this point, it doesn't seem like it's mutating in a way that one would have to worry about it. Um, so, that, so Emma, as does the cumulative data tell us anything about the potential frequency of SARS type viruses jumping from animal hosts to humans in the future? Uh, this is a fantastic and important and critical and perhaps the most important question we need to really consider. Um, this does appear to us to have come out of the blue, to have been in a, a huge thing that no one saw coming, but a lot of people have seen it coming. Um, there have been a whole number of emerging RNA viruses that have made the jump from animal hosts. Um, the big question, of course, is why now? And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, there is the um, degradation of, of environmental degradation where we have um, animals coming into contact, moving habitats, coming into contact with human beings in ways they wouldn't have done before. 
we have this whole idea of bushmeat um, uh, because of economic reasons in Africa and things like that, the eating of chimpanzees, the eating of, of animals that um, have a close enough genetic relationship to us where um, interaction with, with their fecal matter, with their blood, um, with their saliva um, is an important enough thing that can elicit a jump. Um, the other thing we have in, in, in China especially um, is this idea of, of um, which has really come into the upper middle class of eating exotic animals like bats and things like that, which have made these markets really prosper um, and put various of these animals in contact with one another. Um, you know, how, um, if, if it's a pangolin, if it's a, a, a cat, if it's whatever type of rodent that may have picked it up from the bat or it's the bat itself, um, if the bat never comes into contact with a human being, if a human being, um, we don't see this happen. And so why it's happening now seems to be a, a real, um, there seems to be two things which really both come down to the fact that we're coming into contact with these animals in ways um, that we haven't before. Uh, and then another one from L. Jones, is it possible um, that a person can be infected by say the blue clad and the yellow clad. Um, they're probably not separate enough to worry about what this basically does. And, and we can think of these clads in a slightly different way. So if you think about a medieval historian, uh, a medieval historian is looking at a whole bunch of medieval manuscripts of a particular text, right? And they wanna figure out which ones came from which one. And how do they do that? What they do is they look at the, the mistakes that are in the text. So um, if you've got four manuscripts out of 10 that have all the same mistakes, chances are that those manuscripts were copied from one another through time. And it's the same way with these mutations. And this is really the way we build up these trees. We look at these mutations, if they're mistakes in the genetic code and they travel through time. And it's unlikely that they would occur in two different places at two different times. So the strains are not really dif different in the sense um, for the COVID-19 um, that we would think about these as being two different diseases or two different things that would need different vaccines. They're really the same. And these mutations are not big enough to worry about in that sense, but they allow us to basically be able to, to track the virus through time. And so I think we're almost out of time. Um, and so I just want to finish up by thanking everyone who participated. Thank you for your questions. Um, and uh, thank you for supporting, you know, Hopkins at home. Um, I want to thank all the people here who, who, who work so hard to put it together. Um, there's a pretty big team behind this of, of planners and people who do the um, closed captioning uh, and the producers who keep everything running well. Um, so I want to thank all of those people and I want to thank everyone here. Um, thank you for um, participating at Hopkins at Home.